So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Can you hear me, Pasha? Good. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you um, talk a little more? I couldn't hear you. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, no? now I can hear you. But when it was down, I couldn't hear you. Okay, I will be holding my microphone. Oh, sweet. <laughs> that must be, that's going to be fun. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you can see everybody else, but uh, I'm Foster Lyons. This is the first time I'm meeting. Uh, now I'm going to call you Pasha because that's easier for me, but I'm going to let you say your full name for the benefit of everybody here. Yeah. Well, my full name is Pavlo. My last name is Starikov. Pavlo is just a Ukrainian version of the name Paul. So it would be, you know, same as Pablo in Spanish, Pavlo V, P-A-V as in Victor L-O. But my nickname is Pasha. So okay. this is how my, my family calls me, Pasha. I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. So now on my screen, uh, Molly Vick is on the, the upper left. So Molly is an architect, usually working out of uh, New York City with a firm called Ferguson Shamamian. Turns out they are the uh, the country and the world's largest uh, dedicated to residential, single family residential. Am I getting that right, Molly? Yep. Okay. And sh but you're now at the moment you're working out of Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. Yep. Pennsylvania. Okay. Somewhere in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, undisclosed location in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <It's> classified. <laughs> yes. And in my bottom left, you have uh, Christy Cronin. Uh, of Building Science Fight Club. She is the- Williamson uh, now, Foster, oh, Williamson. Okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, okay, fine, I'm Williamson, sorry. Um, <laughs> so she is- Took me a know, long time to find a man to marry, so. <laughs> <laughs> she is the uh, founder, CEO, and president. Um, and uh, if you're not following her on Instagram, you certainly I should. Am, I am, I started following <laughs> Oh, you did? Oh, with thank a, you. With a great interest, yes. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, um, Pasha, this is being recorded, so make make sure you've hit your record button, and I may need to give you permission, actually. Yes, Probably you the do. same with you, Christy. Yep. It is showing recording in the left upper corner. Great. Yeah, then... no, 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 but you gotta you got to record it for yourself, too. Like, on yours, oh, Pasha. Oh, record. Yes, yes yeah, yeah. I, think I guess I'm, it records it everybody's yeah. audio independently. Anyway. Yeah. And I, well, anyway, just to Pasha, for your sake, um, when this is over, you've got to save your recording on your computer and then you got to upload it to the um, Dropbox link I sent you. And then the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art does what they do with it. They edit it and eventually they'll publish it. So, but they haven't done it yet, so who knows? This could just yeah, be yeah, yeah. Eh, whatever, you know. <laughs> this, out could of my just control. Be, this could just be for us. <laughs> yes. Um, so, for everybody else's benefit, I'll give you the I'll, I'll give you the, the one minute of uh, why I invited Pasha. So, first of all, Pasha's a, a as far as I'm concerned, a a, 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 a tiling installation expert, and spe more specifically, even more of an expert, what I would call a light colored and specifically white marble in wet areas. Um, but I first spoke with Pasha because of a project I was involved with in New York City. Uh, the, the company I was working for actually found him and then asked me to go figure out if I believed him or they, they sent me some information like, what do you think? And I read it and I was like, holy shit, this guy knows what he's talking about. And I wish I knew this stuff. Uh, so then I, I emailed and I spoke with him and this and that. Um, so uh, he has uh, not only you know been a practitioner uh, as a ceramic tile and, and marble installer, he's dedicated himself to doing a whole bunch of research, like building stuff in his backyard and letting it get rained on and this sort of thing, uh, which is, you know, it's crazy in our industry, right? Um, so uh, that's probably enough of an introduction. Uh, and But I, I'm going to start with a question, Pasha, and then hopefully you can take it from there. Is it true that you were a professional soccer player? 
Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's Wait, so, really? That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> Is that what got you to the United States? Uh, no, but uh, because I played soccer, when I uh, lived in Switzerland, Lausanne, Switzerland. This is. Oh, I, I love Canada. Lausanne. <laughs> I love. I love. Sorry. Yeah, I love Lausanne. <laughs> is it not just absolutely beautiful? Uh, it is for tourists, but not for those who live there. They don't have time to enjoy the views and everything, so they're allowed to tour. Wait. So you were? Oh, I'm sorry. I was so excited about Lausanne. Why were you living there? Uh, well, I. I try to find a professional club there. My sister lives in Lausanne, Switzerland. She's lived there for 20 years now. And I played there for one of the clubs, uh, not for their main club. And this is how I met my wife. So she lived, uh, I met her online actually when I was in Switzerland. <laughs> and I, I, I had no plans to move to the United States, but eventually we ended up moving to the United States. Yeah, back in 2008. So I came, I moved to the United States in October 2008, uh, and I, I think the uh, the uh, crisis started two weeks later. Wow, you it was like a, bringing a disease with you, like you know. So, so I've I've been living in the U.S. for for 20 years now, um, but I I recently married an American, and I'm just going through the green card process, and I just got authorization to work in the U.S. And then coronavirus started, so I'm uh, following in your footsteps. Wow, where are you originally from? Where are you from? From Canada, but actually, my the oh, way okay. the reason I know Lausanne is my grandparents uh, lived in Montreux, so just. Uh, just the next town over. But um, anyway, yeah, you guys, you Americans yeah, yeah. better I, be careful who you I let in. <laughs> so Tasha, when you, uh, when you came here, you know, did you have the like, ceramic tile in your, in your background, like, you know, growing up or this or that, or you just like, just okay. had needed to work when you got here and that's what you did? Yeah, well, my joke is that uh, before I moved to the United States, I worked with my feet better than with my hands. So <laughs> <laughs> my whole life was committed to soccer and my plans were to become, you know, one day to become a professional soccer coach, uh, to coach a team. But I had, you know, I had no plans to become a construction worker, especially a tile installer. But then when I came, uh, well, just, you know, in a nutshell, um, I tried to, uh, to go to Portland Timbers, uh, you know, pr Portland professional team. But uh, back then, I was out of practices for maybe six months. It was very difficult, and I was still considered as a non-American soccer player. So there were some limits, and I just realized that I would need to go to a different club, and that would mean you know, going traveling across the country. And I just realized that my family uh, was more important to me than my soccer career, and I just you know, quit. And uh, I'm very happy because for professional athletes, it's actually really hard to adopt to a real life because, I mean, at the age of, you know, around 26, uh, I mean, I had no experience but soccer and it's really tough. And if you quit at the age of 35, sometimes you're not ready for real life at all. Wow. And if you don't have any savings, well, you could start, you know, as an entry level uh, construction worker, and very difficult and tough for your family. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm glad that I started my path, uh, well, 11 years ago already. So, cool. But I'm happy with what I'm doing right now. I love professional tile and stone installation. So professional uh, sports taught me uh, a professional approach to things, so, which I'm cool. glad for. So uh, I've you know, read all your stuff and really took a deep dive into it because I'm that variety of a nerd. Um, but for the benefit of our listening audience, do um, you think you could briefly describe like the, 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 the problem, so to speak, that we're going to end up talking about for the next, you know, 45 minutes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'll try, I, I'll try, I, I will try to not take much time to explain it. So um, two years ago, I did a full Carrara Marble uh, master bathroom, including a walk-in shower fully done with Carrara Marble. And I did my best. I am a very detailed tile contractor. I did everything myself. And uh, two weeks later, after the customer had started using the shower, she gave me a call and explaining that she has very strange dark spots on, in, her, in her shower floor, newly installed shower floor. And they wouldn't go away, even like if it took a few days without taking a shower. 
asking it, I was, I mean, kind of shocked because, uh, I mean, it was looking very strange. She saw, uh, she sent me some pictures. And when I came there, it looked as though there was standing water right below the stone. And I knew for sure that the, the water had no room to stand there because I had my slope, everything was done right. I had my waterproofing. And I mean, but I had to do something. So I had to fix that floor. And so this is how uh, I became familiar with this problem. I started so doing my just, research. This is just two years ago. Two years ago. So it this is almost, this is... yeah, it was two years ago. It was April. She called me in May uh, 2018. It was and exactly you couldn't, two years ago. You couldn't blame it on the, the, the construction cleaning company that you know cleaned before the homeowner moved in or the, the electrician who put his ladder on the or the the flooring contractor who spilled stain or none of that huh none of that it looked it looked wet it looked like you know wet floor like partially and uh, I started calling uh, my industry peers from my town professional contractors and they told me yes this is we are familiar with that problem it's very common for white colored marble and nobody knows for sure why it's happening, why it happens. So what's the cause and how to prevent it? They started, you know, telling me different things about mineral uh, composition of marble, et cetera, et cetera. But I became so curious, you know, to find the cause. And it took me, I mean, it took me days when I was just searching internet, including European Google, uh, translating different articles, trying to figure out what was happening with that floor. And just being short, uh, um, I was able to connect with one um, stone expert from Florida. His name is uh, Fred Houston. He's a well-known stone expert with almost 40 years of experience. He does forensic investigation uh, for style and stone tailors. And he started kind of, you know, guiding me and helping me. And he was very curious about, you know, the solution of that problem as well. And this is how we started our research and testing. So I ended up, we originally, actually, so originally we thought, we realized that something was holding moisture inside the stone. And we thought that it was just sealer, penetrating sealer, because I did seal my floor. It was uh, grouted with epoxy grout, and it was sealed with a very good uh, penetrating sealer. It's called 511 Porous Plus, which is one of the most expensive on the tile and stone market. And we thought that it was just sealer holding moisture inside the stone. And um, uh, so we, we, rea we, we realized that, you know, do doing different things in our research, and then I decided to construct uh, different shower modules done with different methods just to recreate those situations that we have in, inside showers. And I started talking to different manufacturers and stone suppliers, and they were very uh, you know, supporting, supportive to me. And this is how it all started. But when we started doing the research, so the actual testing, and also some people you know, kind of ridiculed me that you cannot do your own experiments on your, in your own backyard or your garage, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, after we started doing things and uh, regardless of weather conditions, regardless of installation methods, uh, it started showing you no know, same results in any weather with any, you know, things that you could do to that shower modules. So, and eventually we came to the conclusion that we pretty much, we understand uh, the cause of uh, natural stone moisture discoloration that, that happens in shower floors with light colored marble, especially Carrara or Calcutta type marble. And we are pretty sure that we know the prevention of that problem. And uh, so I will, you can ask me different questions about it, but right now in the summer, we're going to construct uh, new eight modules just to show those two methods that we found as those that work. And we just wanted to show how those methods provide great results with uh, Carrara Marble installed uh, at shower floors. But you mind if I cut in that. with a quick, quick question? So specifically, the problem you're talking about is, is what appears to be wetness within the stone. It's not uh, like a brown, uh, staining, which it's not oxidation that 
know, can happen as well yeah. inside the stone. But even oxidation, in many cases, it doesn't happen when everything is done with a proper method. When there is proper water evacuation, uh, oxidation will most likely never happen with Quran. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's that oxidation is that that classically sort of brown rust, yes. dull rust color. Yes. And that that I find that you know that's a common issue for me. I get called in on all sorts of different problems, and that comes up for me regularly. Oxidation yes. happens when moisture is trapped either inside or under the stone for a prolonged time. Then oxidation so, can happen. So this this wetness problem that you're talking about is sort of the precursor to the yes. oxidation yes. problem. Got it. So well, wait. Yeah. So it, would it would it continue? Like if the if it's wet and you left it, this would you expect oxidation to happen later? And it doesn't necessarily mean it will happen. But it can. It, okay. It can, depending on how much iron does marble have, and. Nobody knows how much until you do labs or you know you test it. The stone yeah. itself. Okay. All right. And one other point for uh, the listening public. Um, I did the calculation once in my career, but it turns out shower stalls get far more rain in them than the rainiest place on the face of the earth, uh, which gets something like. 450 or 500 inches of rain a year shower stalls get like over a thousand the equivalent of over a thousand inches of rain so they're incredibly wet places uh you know people like me and christy are constantly talking about water and dealing with water and building yeah. enclosures and how to and how to mitigate the risks and this and that well, it okay, turns out that let, let me quickly show you what i'm talking about just to visualize it i didn't prepare any other pictures but this is from this is from the NTCA reference manual. So I'm the member of the National Tile Contractors Association, and this is one of the most reputable reference manuals, uh, you know, industry documents for tile and stone installers in the yep. U.S. So on page uh, 260, chapter 10, it has some examples, and you can see. Do you see oh, that yeah. floor? That's natural stone. And it has dark area around the drain, and also dark area along the per, along the perimeter. Yeah, it just looks wet. Yes. Yeah. And you see I, know, I think people know that. what you mean with marble looking looking wet. It's it's darker, but it's just it looks wet. It just yeah. But looks also, wet. we're we're not talking about just you know. In, so I have a sheet of Carrara marble. So we are not talking about just individual pieces getting darker. You know, some pieces will react differently to water. But we are talking about blotchy looking Holy random uh, uh, stains that surpass individual tiles. And it looks like, you know, like stain and more, uh, you know, and that stain would grow. And even if the, if the shower is stopped uh, being used, those stains can, can keep growing for sometimes it would take months. Because so, so you found out that it, what, what it wasn't, but what is it? Yes. So. Maybe you have any mine. My, I have. I have the <laughs> tile that you showed me. Uh, that's. I have that. Oh, um, it's a little bit larger, but it's the. It's that's the tile in my shower, and it doesn't look stained. Okay. But um, so, what did my contractor do right, or accidentally? He. I'm sure he didn't know. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> He's it a nice very, guy, but yeah. I don't think he knew. <laughs> it is very important. So I. Um, I recently wrote an article, and that article will be published in the July uh, edition of uh, Tile Letter magazine. Um, so it's not published yet. But uh, it, it is important to point out that marble has been used for wet areas for a very long time. Very long time. Marble is a suitable stone for wet areas. I have a, um, a very good book that you can uh, I would highly recommend you to purchase. It's called Dimension Stone Design Manual by Natural Stone Institute. Right now it's called Natural Stone Institute. It's a former Marble Institute of America. You can purchase this book. You can also download different chapters online from their website. So it's called Dimension Stone Design Manual. I have volume eight. 
Uh, it's a very informative book. It's all about natural stone installation, you know, et cetera, et cetera, selection and maintenance. So marble is actually, is not a very porous material as many people think. Mm. Marble is a very dense, compact stone, and it's absolutely suitable for wet areas. Well, do you um, mind if I just jump in? You say wet areas, indoor areas wet areas. Would be showers. Showers. Indoors, though, not outdoors. For the, well. Uh, well, wet areas, yeah. I would prefer, definitely, yes. You know, in our climate, it's better to not install marble outside because right now we have, I mean, it will be subject to weathering with this, you know, weather that we have and acidic rains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. I would not recommend installing marble outside in such climate as Pacific Northwest and, you know, those that are uh, areas that are subject to you know very low temperatures maybe it would be good in florida in dry areas but no high humidity in florida well never mind yes <laughs> okay. i would recommend it for interior wet areas like showers uh so before 1990s even before the beginning of 2000s marble was mostly installed in residential showers with a, a so-called traditional dry pack method uh, are you familiar? Are you familiar with that method? Yeah. Uh, Molly, are you familiar with traditional? It's called water in, water out system. So it's a system. It's a tra traditional system that um, you have a traditional uh, waterproofing membrane made of PVC or CPE, and it's made. Uh, so it's a loosely laid membrane that you put on a pre-sloped concrete or dry pack. A cement floor, you connect it to the drain, and then you install another layer of dry pack. It's called dry pack mortar. It's a highly porous sand mixed with Portland cement, one to four or one to five ratio. And that, uh, you know, that uh, dry pack mortar bed provides a, uh, we could call it a bedding of connected porosity. It has a very high porosity so that any water that goes behind the tile or below the tile or below the stone quickly goes toward the drain so it would hit the pre-sloped waterproof membrane and it would go to the drain and it would uh, quickly evacuate so this is a traditional drain it's a tra tra traditional sorry it's a traditional three-part clinton drain drain sorry it has these channels, they're called weep holes. So water would evacuate through those weep holes and it would evacuate to the drain. If that drain, so that system is designed for proper internal water evacuation, meaning that any water that goes below the tile or stone will quickly evacuate. Evac quick, quick, will evacuate? Pasha, yes, quick question ahead. for you. Yes. What percentage of the water that lands on the surface of the tile do you think gets past the surface of the tile into that mud bed below? Depending on how heavily the shower is used and depending on what material is used. With stone, I would say that if a shower, it's a very good question because such experiments have never been done. So nobody knows for sure, but we know for sure that water goes below because sometimes when you have to do, let's say, destructive testing, or you would need to remove tiles and check whether the drain was installed properly, because sometimes the installer doesn't protect the weep holes the weep properly. Holes. Yeah. They, they can get clogged. And in order to do that, so you go, you dig in and you realize that that mortar bed is actually filled with you know, moisture and water because water cannot uh, properly you know, drain and evacuate. Now, so it's, it's Go ahead. Is that um, is that drain that you're showing? So okay, when I do a drain like that, sort of like that on a plaza deck or something, um, what I call it is a two-stage drain. So I have drainage occurring at two different um, up-down levels during uh, in the in the system. So the first place that water can enter the drain is at the walking surface. So like your shower, right? That's you, from the surface of the tiles, it goes down and goes into the drain. The second place that water can uh, enter the drain is 
some other place lower. Uh, so on a plaza deck, if you, you know, outside and you've got pavers or whatever, you have drainage happening at the surface and then underneath also because we know that just like with a shower, some amount of water gets, gets underneath it, but we call it a two-stage drain. Two questions, is the terminology the same? Um, and also, is that par for the course? Is that, are, are, that's what shower drains do, like that's, that's true for most any shower drain is gonna, is gonna have those weep holes like that and have drainage occurring at both levels, or is that special? Uh, this would be, so the traditional three-part clamping drain drain um, is pretty much a traditional drain for that type of system. That system, I can provide you, and I would like to provide all of you with, you know, written information. I, I can send you links. I can, I can also send you uh, links to very good documents that you could have. They're very helpful. For example, this is TCNA, Tile Council of North America handbook for ceramic glass and stone tile installation it's really technical and you will find it very helpful it has a bunch of methods and it describes pretty much every method it, it, it describes the difference between traditional drain and also bonding flange drains that, that i will talk uh, about it later um, uh, so yeah so the terminology could be a little bit different because you know that's a different industry, like tile and stone industry. Yeah, but that's the concept. That. It's yeah, that's the got... concept. That, yeah, that's a that's very, very good word. That's the first concept to provide proper evacuation of water, both uh, topically and internally. So, if that method, there are different details about that method, and uh, it's really important that when stone is installed, it's installed by a um, experienced installer contractor who really knows what he does because not every installer can do the work it's really detailed and uh with ceramic or porcelain tile most of these problems would never be visible but marble light colored stone uh, like marble is translucent you can see you know the translucent stone is the stone that you can see light through and it will show presence of trapped moisture. This is why we see those problems. So this is a traditional system. If it's done properly, water will not be trapped. It will go through stone and it will be evacuated. That's why before the beginning of 2000s, there were not too many cases with Carrara marble discoloration, moisture discoloration at shower floors. It would still happen if the installer did a mistake, if he didn't protect the weep holes, you know, they would get clogged and eventually, you know, it would start a capillary action and it would start, you know, staining the stone. Um, but mostly it would be installed successfully with great results. But in the beginning of 2000s, some newer systems and newer methods were introduced. And right now we have very good systems on the market. Like, uh, I'm not sure whether you're familiar, for example, this is a uh, Schluter drain. Schluter is a German company. It's a very good company. I mostly use Schluter for my shower installations. Uh, and there are similar methods. So those methods are called, um, it's called a bonding, bonded waterproofing membrane, meaning that with this system, with such system, you can install stone directly over waterproofing membrane. So if with, with the traditional system, you have a thick layer of dry pack mortar between the stone and your waterproofing membrane. With that newer system, you install stone or tile directly over waterproofing membrane. And that waterproofing membrane is connected to a, what's called bonding flange drain. And the idea that stands behind it is that water will go below the tile and then it will either quickly evaporate, dry out, or it will go to the drain. And that's where most of the problems with natural stone started occurring in, the, in showers. So it's uh, related to the design and actually the purpose of that system. So the idea that, you know, that many people have is that they think that because waterproofing membrane is right below the stone, water that goes below the stone will evaporate or will dry very quick and that's not true this is the very reason why we have 
stone uh, moisture discoloration in stone shower floors because water is not able, so it's not taken away from the underside of stone. It sits right below it. It's crazy to hear you describe that because it's, I can't even tell you how many forensic investigations I've done for balconies that have failed for exactly the reason you've described, but it hasn't produced staining, it's produced leaks because someone will install a, they'll do exactly what you've described. They'll do a fluid applied waterproofing membrane over on the, on the structure, a concrete structure, wood structure, whatever, and then they'll install whatever their walking surface is right on top. They won't have what you're describing. I think, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've, you're describing one system where there was not, there was a waterproofing material and then on top of it, there was a medium for drainage, uh, a thing that water could flow through. Uh, and then the second system is you have a waterproofing membrane, maybe even a better waterproofing membrane, but we've taken out the medium for drainage I, that's just I. Wow, that's crazy. I, I will try. Foster, I will try to explain it very quickly. I will try to do it in, just in two minutes. So, um, people, many people don't understand that this bonded membrane system. It it can, it comes from different manufacturers. They have different details, but actually, it it's not able to provide internal water evacuation. Because the design of the drain, for example, this is a Schluter drain, and this is just the grate, you know, the top part that you see, but this is the internal part. It is consisted of what's called lateral adjustment ring. It sits mm -hmm. right in the opening yeah. around the drain. And then it has this, it's called height uh, adjustment collar. Yeah, it, that just, so, yeah, lets you get up to the top of the stone. You install this with mortar, and then what, once it's installed, it creates a, at least one, of a, uh, one eighth of an inch dam around the drain. Oh, Water great. Water is not able to seep through it. Yeah. And then, uh, moreover, since it's mortar that you have above, uh, you know, inst uh, that you use to bond your stone to waterproof and membrane, is also is not as porous as dry pack, Water bed, yeah, and water doesn't really go through it. It would go to a certain point and then it would stop. Also, most membranes, ex except for a liquid applied membrane that you know feels like rubber, it becomes pretty much like rubber. They have a, uh, it's called, it's a fleece that is on. It's called anchoring fleece. It's a top layer of the membrane, and that anchoring fleece also absorbs moisture. Some of the prefabricated shower trays, they're made of extruded polystyrene, which is foam, but it has a, a thin cementitious coating on top. That cementitious coating gets wet as well. Once your thin set mortar and the anchoring fleece or the cementitious coating get wet, that water, that moisture pretty much stays there. Oh, gosh, you're like the grim reaper for all these poor manufacturers. <laughs> So there is a good news, though. Uh, Christine used a very good word, concept. So while the first concept provides us with a bedding under the stone that quickly takes away any water from the stone, the second concept would be to not allow any water to go below the stone and be evacuated topically. And that is achieved by using a suitable 100% epoxy solids adhesive, epoxy grout, and a very good and breathable penetrating sealer. That method is the only method that will be suitable for those bonded membranes. And actually that is a better method. I will explain why a little bit later. But what it does is this, epoxy adhesive properly installed, uh, properly installed would mean 100% coverage with no voids. There is a method how you, you achieve it. Would provide a highly water repellent mortar that doesn't absorb any water because epoxy um, mortar water absorption would be less than 0.5%, same as porcelain. So nothing under the stone would pretty much absorb water. 
then you have epoxy grout that has same water repellency. And then you seal your stone, but not all sealers are equal. So if you use a good quality penetrating sealer, so far I've tested only one that has uh, you know, uh, provided us with great results. It's called Bulletproof Sealer from Stone Tech. Once you seal it, water will be able to enter the stone only as vapor. And the volume of that water or moisture would be so tiny that it would quickly evaporate within a few hours. So I have one of the modules done with that method, and that method has shown absolutely best results. It would get wet just a little bit. The, the stone would you know, get dark just for two hours. And then two hours later, it would dry out and it would return to its original light color. I had that module sitting in my backyard since September 2019. And it went through so many different cycles, weather cycles, you know, through freeze thaw, through, you know, I live in Pacific Northwest, so it rains all the time. And it would show it has shown absolutely the same results. It would return to its original light color within two to three hours. So uh you, you can't imagine how much you're speaking to the the things I love talking about. You're like, you know, my new best friend, believe me. <laughs> but um so for those of us building scientists uh on the in the listening audience, what as far as I'm concerned, what you described is uh this hundred uh, percent epoxies uh adhesive and grout is a is a barrier system. You're preventing liquid water from getting behind the wall you know beneath the walking surface mm -hmm. as opposed to the pre uh two thousand system which was uh a, a drainage system. Um uh, you know you're you're managing the water in a different way. You're let you I don't want to say you're letting the water through but you you know that water is going to get through and you're letting it out in a different way. So that is rather fascinating. Uh, one, uh, there is a few very important points. That old tra or traditional method has some problems when you use modern marble mosaics with it. The biggest problem with that method and modern marble tile is that most of the marble mosaics that we have today on our market would have what's called resin backing. So resin backing doesn't necessarily mean resin. It, most of the times it's polyester. Is polyester resin though? Polyester? Uh, that's uh, close enough, but close enough. not really, but you know. So it's, it's... polyester, it, I don't know whether you will see it, but it's shiny. Yeah. It's a little bit shiny. Um, stone manufacturers, started adding such backing to the back of stone to reduce breakage during handling, transportation, and even installation. Because some marbles, once you cut it, it just starts falling apart. So it reinforces the stone. The problem is that uh, it's not, there is no uniform standard for such backing. Sometimes the installer does, doesn't even know what type of backing that is. It's impossible to figure it out. But this looks like polyester. The problem is that you cannot install stone with such fiberglass reinforcement with traditional uh, mortars. You have to bond it with epoxy adhesive because uh, traditional mortars would require what's called moisture exchange between mortar and and uh, whatever you install, yeah. stone or tile. This yep. backing would prevent moisture to grab onto the stone. It's a quick question. What what it that you then get it 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 um you lose its adhesion, right? It just falls right. off eventually, correct? Like like also, thin set stone falling off the side of a building. Yes. So yes, to speak. Yes. Yes. Also. It, it adds another impervious layer under the stone. And any water, let's say water will penetrate below the grout Makes line. Makes it even worse, yeah. It goes yeah. into the dry pack mortar, and then some, so you're, you guys are building scientists, you know it much better than I, but there will be some evaporation. But during that evaporation, you know, the moisture that evaporates would hit this impervious uh, backing, and it would start collecting under the stone creating yeah. this problem that we're discussing here. 
So that's why that newer method is more acceptable. It's, it's a more, um, I would say, suitable, and it's a better method for modern marble mosaics. Also, it, there is a very important thing about sealers. Many people, including myself two years ago, think that penetrating sealers or impregnators are what I would call it a cure for all maladies. So people think that all you have to do, you have to really, I mean, you have to seal your stone, possibly with a few uh, coats of very good penetrating sealer, and it would solve all problems associated with stone in wet areas. People think that sealer applied to stone would prevent stone from absorbing water, and that is not true. Actually, it's a vice versa, because no sealer that we have on the market would actually prevent water to enter the stone. Water will still enter the stone, and uh, this is plus to what we discussed with you in our first email. So you mentioned uh, capillary condensation. So there are different ways, but water would still enter a sealed stone, is either as liquid or as vapor. Once it's there, it can condense into liquid and sealer is not breathable for liquid. It's only breathable for vapors. Once you have liquid under the sealed stone, it would be trapped. And then so, it takes a long yeah. time for that moisture to turn, uh, to, uh, to become vapor and be evaporated. That's yeah. the problem. So most of the problems that we have is with fully sealed shower pans that people think you know, would be the best method, but it's, it's actually not. So the only, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Tell me any no, details. that's all, I, I'm loving it, believe me. I'm, I'm gonna just try to hold myself back from using all the fancy thermodynamic words to describe any of that. Um, but it, I had heard over the years, uh, some installers had have told me that you should not use epoxy grouts with white marbles because it can get some bleed in and staining and this and that. So what's the story there, if there is one? It's a good question. Uh, with Carrara marble, epoxy adhesive or grout would usually never cause any problems associated with what's called bleeding inside the stone or sometimes with bigger tiles you see you know, dark edges along the perimeter. It's yeah, called picture framing. Picture framing, right. With Carrara marble, it's a very dense stone. I've never yeah. seen. I've done many modules and I've talked to many installers. Epoxy grout normally or any other grout would normally never cause such problem with Carrara marble. With other stones though, like onyx or some limestones, that are softer, it could cause some problems. So in our research, we're specifically talking about Carrara marble, light colored marble. Got and it. The problem is when I started this research and experiment, I first tried to inspire uh, shower systems manufacturers to do this. I, 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 I tried to talk to them and you know convince them to start doing that. And nobody was really interested. So everybody was interested in getting results, but not testing it because they didn't want to take the responsibility. <laughs> well, yes, uh, I'm sure you now know that there is very little research done in the yes. construction and building industry, and even less in the architecture industry, as far as I can tell. And, and the former, the <laughs> former technical director for the Natural Stone Institute told me uh, that actually nobody has ever really tested. Carrara marble in shower in showers in wet areas. So they have some information, but there is no testing behind most of that information. Just feel the just wild. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of areas that you sort of assume that this there must be some formal apparatus that this exists on, but it just doesn't. I was shocked to learn that about um, ventilation rates. Uh, by the way, like I mean, there's stuff that we've studied, but it's just shocking how many conventions that you assume are based on something really scientific and it turns out that it's from research done in like the 1840s or something like uh, back when yeah. you know whatever it, it's it's kind of amazing when we when you look into where these rules of thumb come from 
So, Pasha, I, I, I really find this fascinating because a lot of clients, contractors, people like myself, architects deal with you know, a, a lot of problems in this regard. I mean, it's it's like every architect's nightmare is to get that phone call from the homeowner, like, oh my God, you know, there's this problem. And like, okay, let's call the contractor and put them out of business. Um, and to f to find out that it there's actually like a logical explanation and, and means to solve it, I find absolutely fascinating. Um, one of the things that I typically am trying to recommend to architects in the early stages of design um, is to not specify anything with regard to how uh, a shower stall should be made until they know what material is going to go on the floor or the walls. Is that a wise thing to say or, or, or is there some universal thing like yeah. is, could it is it the same for slabs as it is for tiles or ceramic that tile gonna versus... be my question foster because most of our clients have slab layouts not tile yeah. in their showers and then the other thing i wanted to ask about was radiant flooring most of our showers have some type of heat element in the floor and if that affects that obviously needs a mortar bed or something to set in yep okay uh, yeah, these are very good questions. So, um, first of all, it would be very great if architects um, could become familiar with some of the uh, tile and stone industry technical documents. There oh, are you breaking up on me? What? What? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> they are very informative and they are very great. TCNA handbook for ceramic, glass, and stone tile installation very great resource uh, this is more for tile and stone installers this is called NTCA reference manual and then specifically for stone we have what i showed you uh, previously dimension stone design manual but it would be also great uh, just to you know connect with uh, have connections with professional tile and stone contractors you could always consult with regarding specific installations because it's also it's it's all case by case situations and it has many details in it and i'm not crazy in in thinking that for many materials and uh applications those manuals allow multiple different methods of installation yes so the 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 method you described specifically for uh, white Carrara marble tiles, that's that's not universal for every variety of of Carrara installation. Like if if somebody wanted a a, a Carrara slab floor, you wouldn't do that. I mean, I don't think you could do that, right? You'd have to use the traditional, um, you know, mud bed. Depending on whether you have any backing, polyester or resin backing on the back huh. of your stone. Wow, yeah. I hadn't... Many details have to be taken into consideration. It's a case-by-case -case situation. Actually, in Europe, they mostly have, I searched uh, Italian, Google, and you know, I saw so many pictures. They have prefabricated Carrara shower trays, seamless that are installed on shower floors. Yeah. Those slabs will actually will not show discoloration as much as stone mosaics. Stone mosaics would show it the most, but if installed properly, it will not show any discoloration. So if yeah, you see, um, situation. yeah, go ahead, sorry. If you see the discoloration on the floors, would you ever find it on other horizontal surfaces like a bench or a niche? Um, if you end up with water on those yes it can happen on any horizontal surface inside the shower most likely it so i tested uh i had 10 mo carrara modules all of them were made with tile not bigger than two by two so two inches by two inches but i had two modules done with 
four inches by four inches by four inches tiles. Discoloration was not very visible on bigger tiles because that you know moisture would kind of blend in because of the bigger size of the tile. It would be kind of spread inside the tile. I can't explain it very very well, but it would yeah it would the entire floor would remain kind of darker, but it would not have blotchy you know random looking staining. So if you have a Carrara um, like slab on installed on a bench shower bench, most likely that discoloration you know in patterns would not be very visible. At the same time, if, if you mind if I jump in a little bit, Pasha? I, I, you know, I, you. I met Posh because of one specific job that I'm not at liberty to talk about, really. However, it's worthwhile um, hearing that um, certainly in steam rooms, you can get this, this variety of dis, uh, wet discoloration on any surface that's tiled, meaning the ceiling, the wall, the niche, the mm -hmm. fancy thing, you know, the built in the wall, you name it, everywhere. Yes. Uh, further, it's not just white tiles, as Pasha said, it's translucent tiles. So you can get tr translucent marble in almost any color, um, like original color. And then all of a sudden, when it gets this moisture inside of it, it's no longer its original color and looks wet and problematic. And, and Yes. So it, it's definitely not just horizontal surfaces. It's really like I wanted to mention much, the steam shower as well. How much water oh. is there and how it got there? Anyway, once that happens, Foster, is it a replacement job or is there some type of treatment or repair? Uh, well, you may have to send me a retainer check before I answer, but uh, it's. <laughs> I'm, Not my, in that my, specific job. In general, like if you saw I, that happen in another shower. My quick answer is going to be, uh, you're going to have like the only real way to deal with it is to pull it out and and redo it the proper way. Uh, in other words, if it's really wet, standing, Posh is going to be better at answering this than me. He's probably done this a hundred times. Uh, but if I was, if I got called in to make a recommendation, it would be sorry, yank it out and do it this very specific way that Pasha is recommending? It would, re it would require a, a, a forensic investigation because it all depends. Sometimes you can kind of, um, uh, depending on how it was originally installed, you can improve the look. You cannot fully you know, fix it, but you can improve the look by adding something. In some situations, adding a very breathable sealer like Stone Tech Bulletproof would help, but only in few cases, not in all of them. If there's any um, other type of, you know, air or fault in the stone, a crack or some natural um, deformation in that, does that contribute to the staining or is that completely a separate concern? Uh, when we are talking about moisture discoloration, uh, Normally, it would only happen due to an appropriate method, installation method. Uh, because the stone, uh, like marble, Carrara marble composition is pretty much the same. And it's a carbonate rock. And Because that's a, that's a common thing that contractors will say when this fails. They'll really blame it on the, the, stone. the stone, not the way that it was installed. You are it. so right, yes. <laughs> The, actually, yeah. the name of the article that I just uh, wrote for uh, Tile Letter Magazine is, uh, it's called, as far as I remember, not, um, Marble Moisture Discoloration, Don't Blame the Stone. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, because I hear it all the time. No, no, no. Don't, uh, so I participate yeah. in closed Facebook groups. Some of them you know, has, uh, have up to 10,000 members. And they all blame natural stone. And I, 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 I'm saying, no, don't blame the stone. It's, it has been used for wet areas for a very long time with great results. And even nowadays, some installers still install it with great results. And some people say, you know what? Natural stone will, will be subject to discoloration from shampoos and soap, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a picture. I, I should have uh, um, 
printed that picture out and show it to you. Uh, it's a picture of a 20-year-old 20 year 20-year-old marble shower. It just gets basic uh, cleaning with pH neutral cleaner occasionally. It looks better than any other ceramic shower that I personally saw in my uh, Thailand stone career. It looks great because the great news about natural stone is that it can be restored from pretty much almost any condition except for sometimes like heavily oxidation, heavy oxidation. But it can be restored, it can be cleaned. That's why maintenance is also a very important part of any installation. So we don't start, uh, no, uh, so our job, my job as a professional Thailand stone installer is not finished when I just install things. I provide my customers with information how to properly treat that specific product that they have in their shower. I provide them with information and you know, very basic and proper cleaners. And I explain oh. that if you don't maintain it properly, it doesn't matter how good I installed it, it will lose its aesthetical you know, uh, beauty. How, how frequently should a, a stone in a, in a shower that's getting used regularly uh, get resealed uh, you know, with this, this you know, bulletproof sealer? Yeah, uh, so once um, pretty much, you know, bulletproof sealer penetrates uh, below the surface of the stone for maybe uh, one eighth of an inch. So it goes pretty deep and uh, it will, I cannot, I don't know exactly how many years it will take, but once people start seeing that, you know, that discoloration remains longer on the surface of stone, uh, they, could, they could do a uh, water test just by putting a few drops of water. And normally, if you leave it for 10 minutes, just a few drops. And then if after 10 minutes, you can see a dark spot in your stone, that would mean that water started penetrating stone as liquid. That would indicate that stone needs to be resealed. If Got after it. 10 minutes, you wipe it off and there is no dark spot, that would mean that sealer you know, prevents water to enter the stone as liquid. Can I use this uh, bulletproof on a on a countertop too? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So a sealer is <laughs> asking for a friend. No, very good, very good point. <laughs> I'm specifically talking about wet areas and natural stone, like. Oh no. Any dry area. Uh oh. Pasha, you slowed down. Pasha? Oh, shoot. Ah. <laughs> oh, well. Now I'm never oh. going to know. No, hey, yeah, that's right when he gets the wine the... spills on the counter. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Actually, you know what I have on my counter? I, have, I bought this house and I wanted marble countertops. I don't know why. It was such a stupid decision. I didn't cook then and now I cook and now I'm like, uh, whoopsie. <laughs> anyway, um, my during my like big housewarming party thing i had this uh, a, a, an enormous champagne bucket and the champagne bucket the just the water there's a water stain still on my counter from the, <laughs> from the champagne bucket. Have, this two, yeah. was two years ago i mean it helped me get over there's lots That's, of imperfections yeah. in it and whatever yeah, i like it yeah. it's fine and but um but that my hmm can i get rid of this yeah right <laughs> yeah it may i don't yeah Anyway, I find this particular this subject fascinating awesome. because, I mean, first of all, he knows it's like crazy the amount of knowledge he has. And it, like, I, I like, I, I, Molly, you know, you could speak for as a practicing architect in this, in this group here. Like, it, my experience back, you know, as a, when I was a contractor for all those years, like, problems with finishes are where you end up spending all your time. And that's where the homeowners get the most irritated and that, and you know, guys like me love to talk about insulation and vapor, this, that, but the, the truth is the homeowners, like it's what they look at and what they deal with. And, you know, quite frankly, what they spend a gobs of money on. And it is complicated, you know, like here he is, he's got all this knowledge. He's, He's sort of talking about like one variety of stone. And there's, you know, I don't know, there's a hundred varieties. It's crazy. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, I always feel great when I find people like this because I'm like, oh, my God, I have somebody to call. You know, it's fantastic. And hey, you're back. You're back. <laughs> we were. Uh, right. 
No. So we, so we, so we missed it. What do, can I, can I use my, can I use this bulletproof on my, on my, uh, my friend? Can my friend yes. use this on? You can, you can. Actually, most impregnating sealers would be absolutely okay in dry areas. It's not just bulletproof sealer. Most of the impregnating sealers that are on the market are okay to use in dry areas. Countertops, you know, uh, tile uh, flooring, etc. Yes. Huh. So, Pasha, uh, you know, there's a, there's 101 other general types of stone, you know, limestones and granites and et cetera, et cetera. So everything you've talked about tonight is, is rather specific to translucent marbles. Mm -hmm. So what are the chances you could forward us the list of names of the other experts that are expert in all these other uniquely uh, special stones, you know, because it's, it's, it is very complex. And I, 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 you've done a great job of, of really uh, explaining the complexity of what everybody sort of believes is so simple. Oh, just go put tile, you know, on the floor or on the wall or whatever. No, 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 it's not nearly that simple. It's, it's very complex. Um, what's your recommendation for, you know, designers and practitioners and, people like me that go in and have to solve problems after the fact, um, you know, regarding this, this, this crazy complexity. Any words of wisdom for us? Well, uh, this document will give you a lot of information regarding other stones like travel yep. limestone. It names, you know, different uh, um, reasons for uh, tailors. Uh, associated with those stones. Also, I would, of course, I would highly recommend to contact one of the Thailand stone experts, including myself. And I also know very good, experienced people with uh, great background in the Thailand stone industry who could always help you with their specifications and recommendations. And I would highly recommend you, maybe for one of your next meetings. I would highly recommend you to um, um, invite uh, Dr. Fred Houston. I mentioned him earlier, so he was the one who was helping me a lot. Yep. And he actually, he hosts a uh, the only stone and tile radio talk show in the United States, as far as I know, and where he touches, you know, different problems associated with tile and stone. So he's a great expert and he does, um, um, annual classes for uh, tile and stone inspectors. So he's a very experienced person and he could cover you know, other types of stone and uh, answer all your questions. I so would highly recommend you to invite him. It's been my experience that some of the material manufacturers, you know, the, the grout manufacturers, the thin set manufacturers are not quite as helpful as I would have, I would hope they would be. And, and uh, I'm going to say multiply that by 10 for the sealers, the, the manufacturers of sealers. Uh, do you find that also to be true? And, and do you have any manufacturers that it, that's not true and they're really great in, with, with Actually, regard to their information? We just recently did a, um, it's called Z Panel. It's an annual event with, from one of the, uh, by one of the local stone suppliers and actually their manufacturer of stone, natural stone. They helped me a lot by donating uh, Carrara marble for my experiments. And uh, they're actually, they are going to write uh, their own specification for natural stone Carrara marble installation in shower areas. And also, um, for example, in our area here in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have great uh, uh, stone and tile supplies and shower systems manufacturer representatives that are very uh, responsive and they're very help i mean they're very great people that are ready to, to help you whenever you call them right but i'm not crazy like no sealer lists a a, a perm rating a vapor permeance rating they just they don't, I don't even, even list think, it yeah. even, no, doesn't even not even listed that's why yeah. in, our, in, our next, <laughs> in, the next, in the next phase of our experiment, we're going to test 
four different penetrating sealers from four different manufacturers. Actually, we will be helping those manufacturers uh, to see how their sealers work with those specific yeah. methods. <laughs> and I'm not going to name the manufacturer, uh, but the, in terms of like grout and, and uh, thin set adhesive, I find it very difficult to get like great useful information out of those manufacturers. And they have great, I'm not going to they have great products. But, you know, when you're trying to help somebody specify products and you want to really make sure you're getting it right, like it's really nice to talk to somebody like yourself who gives you like direct, useful, you know, actionable information. And I, I, I don't get that out of these manufacturers, you know, and then I find that very difficult. So, so I have, um, I've got a question. I hope it doesn't take too long. Um, but, okay, so I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, when you were describing testing the the permeance, the true permeance of these sealers, it made me think of research that Graham Finch has done. Um, he's uh, he's a building scientist with RDH Consulting uh, in your neck of the woods. He's in Vancouver, uh, Canada, but um, they the company has a has a pretty a Seattle and a Portland office. Um, anyway they were testing roof membranes, uh, flat, like, um, oh my gosh, I'm losing all my words here, fluid applied membranes that, are, that go on flat roofs, right on, and applied over concrete. And they were finding that they, were, they would get failures, they'd get bubbles in, in between the concrete and the roof membrane. So Graham did a whole bunch of testing and found that, um, what these weren't leaks water was accumulating under the membrane because of salts in the concrete the chloride con content of the concrete and um water would hit would be on would be sitting on the top of these membranes and it would uh there'd be an osmotic drive pulling the water through the membrane and when he did testing it turned out that a lot of these manufacturers and he did he found it's sort of funny i want to introduce you guys because he found uh, his the process was very similar to yours in that he asked a whole bunch of questions nobody had done this kind of testing and the manufacturers wanted the results but they didn't most of them didn't want to they were kind of they didn't want to they didn't want to know either uh, anyway he did some testing and he found that these membranes that were advertised as being impermeable it turned out were not as imper impermeable to vapor uh, as as um, advertised, and the permeance ended up affecting this osmotic transfer. And you get, I mean, these blisters are crazy. If if anybody's listening and wants to kind of Google this, Google Graham Finch and uh, os an osmosis, and you can see these these roofs bubbling up. Oh, it's crazy! And if you if you punch a hole through it it's like that you get a get a fountain it's it's nuts so my question for you is uh in all of this stuff do i'm sure there's a completely different study of how the salt content the salt and mineral content of these mortars that we're using can react with different types of stones and present all kinds of problems whether it's osmosis or staining or is there is there anything I've said that you can comment on and provide something useful, or or is this just uh, the beginning of a of a college level class? It could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could be, but just from our experience, uh, moisture discoloration that we we're talking about is not actually staining of the stone because stain cannot go away by itself. So if something is caused by something within the stone then it would stain, literally stain the stone. It would never go by itself. It can be removed with a poultice method that will kind of suck it out and remove it. But that, that is just moisture discoloration. It's only moisture that is- I stained. love the clarification in the terminology. I will, I will not make that mistake again. I will, I, and, I will use and I'm this not, too. And I'm not crazy, Pasha. Like with white marble, you absolutely have to use white Portland cement. You cannot, Yes. use because it's translucent if you use dark cement and that is actually one of the general requirements for any natural stone installation uh, white uh, white uh, mortar is highly recommended because uh, with a few exceptions 
gray um, gray mortar will contribute to you know just darkening of the stone. It would look darker. Yeah. And uh, you asked me about the uh, perm ratings for penetrating sealers. Actually, there is no information on that. But yeah. uh, <laughs> waterproofing membranes do have the perm rating for their uh, sheet applied membranes. Yes. So all of the like shooter and those membranes, they do have perm rating. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was. That's easy to find. Uh, sealers, like ex for a guy like me, exactly the piece of information I want to, in order to select, you know, one versus another. None of them have it. It's very frustrating. I, before I started doing my experiment, I uh, or yeah, I contacted one of the representatives from a big sealer manufacturer, and I explained him everything, and I told him. You could become the first sealer company that would do such experiment. Do it. I'm a small contractor. You have much more resources than I do. And he would not be interested. And I said, okay, then I will have to do it. <laughs> in, in their defense, it's, it's, it's rather complicated. In other words, what's, you know, it's a penetrating sealer, the permeance of, you know, a, Carrara marble with that sealer is going to be different than the permeance of, you know, Calicutta marble with that sealer versus uh, granite with that sealer. It's a, it is a complicated problem. Um, I but yeah, I still but want it. Yeah, but they figure it out for NFPA 285. They can figure it yeah, out. That's a good point. They that's got labs point. and money yes, and stuff, yes. right? Yep. Well, I should let all of you go back to your lives. We've been on at this for about an hour and 15 minutes. It's, uh, it's not really supposed to go much longer than that. Pasha, I love this stuff. This is great. You can call me anytime you want if you just want to talk. <laughs> I will. <laughs> so thank you. Molly, thank you for listening in. Uh, Christy, thank, thank you, you for again. Thank you teaching me something new. Absolutely. Yeah. This is terrific. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this is like, you know, drinking water from a fire hose. This is, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Pasha is way ahead of the curve here, as far as I can tell. Um, if there's one other person like him in the United States, I'd be surprised. Uh, I think you're listening to information that is not going to become like general public information for a number of years. Um, so well, you uh, know what? Uh, we are working. So uh, our research was presented at the NTCA annual meeting in February. And most likely it will be, I don't know how much from our research, but some of it will be, should be published in the new edition of the reference manual, 2020, 2021 uh, uh, edition. I don't so have hopefully... any doubt. I, I, I'm still trying to get contractors to, to abide by the rules that were written back in 1930. Forget about next the ones that are gonna be written next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's great information. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it will get out there. And, and you know, there's nothing like problems and lawyers to solve, uh, to, to, to fix to fix real problems in our industry. So thank you. All right. So everybody, don't forget to um, save your recording, and then upload it to that Dropbox link. Which hopefully we won't have any trouble this week, as we did last week. So if you have any trouble, just email me, and we'll figure it out. But uh, and it doesn't need to be done tonight, Posh. You can do it tomorrow or the next couple of days or whatever. All right. Anybody have any last questions for Pasha? Molly, that's it, huh? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Molly, Thanks. Thank, nice you. thank you. Thank you. So long. Bye. I got to figure out how to do this now. There we go. There we go.